The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning, Santon Sports Club. Oh, hello. I spoke to one of your colleagues last week about becoming a member of your club and I'd like to go ahead and join, if I can do it over the phone. Absolutely. I'll start by taking a few details, if I may. Of course. What's your name? It's Alex Coos. Can you spell your surname? It's C-O-O-Z-E. Lovely. I've got that. And are you a student or in employment? Employed. Thank you. And can I ask, what's your job? I'm a doctor. Right. Thanks. Now, we don't need to get your full address at this stage, but could I just take your postcode? <laughs> if I can remember it, <laughs> I've only just moved. Yeah, oh, yes, it's uh, GT1. Right. And then 2BN. Is that VN? Uh, no, BN. Sorry. Now, one last question in this section. Can I just ask how you heard about us? Was it from a friend? Actually, I read about the club in a newspaper. It. Uh... That's fine. Thank you very much. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Now, we do offer different types of membership according to which facilities you want to use and when. Yes, I gathered that, but my schedule's a bit problematic. I mainly want to use the gym, and that'll be after about 7pm when I finish work. Fine, right. And will you be interested in swimming? I understand you have both an indoor and an outdoor pool. That's right. <laughs> I'm not a fan of swimming, actually, and certainly don't want to be there when it gets very packed in the evenings. Um, I think I'd only want to use the outdoor one and during the day, when I can get a bit of sunbathing in. And when the children are at school, of course, so it's a bit quieter. A lot of our clients prefer that. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> and I might occasionally want to have a game of badminton, you know... Uh, and I suppose I'd like to book courts on Saturdays and Sundays when I can organise a game with friends. Right. And would you be wanting to use our other club facilities, such as the sauna, steam room or tanning bed? They're open all day until 9pm. Well, I think I'd only want to use the steam room and probably after I've been doing heavy exercise. So shall I put that down as evenings? Sorry, no, I'd probably only use it on Saturdays and the occasional Sunday, you know, when I have more time to relax. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. 
Part 2. You will hear a discussion between two psychology students and their tutor. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. So, how did you find the lecture yesterday? Reasonably interesting, but he sort of rushed through Maslow's work, which, considering it's been covered before, is fine for everyone else except me, who missed the last lesson. Why don't you fill him in then, Tina? Me? Oh, OK. Well, basically, it's simple enough. We all have certain needs, and what Maslow did was group them into categories. Depending on how successful your life has been or what stage of life you are at, your needs change and you shift from one of Maslow's categories into another. First, there's your basic needs. Physiological needs, the professor said. Is that right? Very good. These needs are pretty obvious. They're our most basic ones. Things every human needs to survive and function, like air, water, food, clothing and shelter. It's not rocket science, this bit. Maslow just points out that until we have satisfied those basic needs, our desires don't evolve into anything more complex and we don't seek any greater form of fulfilment. Isn't that a bit irrelevant today? Not really. Millions of people in the developing world are still fighting to fulfil these needs, fighting for their very lives every day. Good point. So anyway, Maslow represented what he called his hierarchy of needs on a pyramid or, in 2D, a triangle with physiological being at the base, presumably. Yes, it's obvious, isn't it? What's at the other end of the spectrum, then? Well, to be at the pinnacle, you've got to have mastered the other levels of need. Then you are in the self-actualization zone. This is a place where you are very at one with yourself and looking to make the absolute most of your skills, talent and potential. You can only focus on maximising these, though, of course, if, as Maslow reminds us, you're fulfilled in every other sense. And what are these in-between levels, then? Well, after you've found food and water and shelter and so on, the next step is to fulfil your safety requirements. Safety does not just mean your physical safety, though. That's far too simplistic. It's also about your emotional safety, your job security and so on. And let me guess, after that it's the need for esteem. No. Maslow reasoned that after your physiological and safety needs are fulfilled, the next most urgent requirement is for friendship, intimacy, companionship and so on. You know, on an emotional level, building a family, having relationships, etc. Only then, after you have found a sense of belonging, does the need for esteem take precedence, he argues. Presumably that's the need to feel accepted and valued. Yes, but more on that later. Do you feel more comfortable now? Yes. Thank you both. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. OK, now that you are both familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, let's look at a few cases in point. Case 1. Uh, crime boss in the slums of Mumbai, what do you think? Surely very low. Physiological, I'd have said. But he has food and shelter. A shed is hardly shelter. And how is living from hand to mouth every day adequate from a nutritional perspective? Oh, of course. You're right if you look at it objectively. But remember that human psychology is far more complicated than that. When quizzed, this person surprised researchers. First of all, he regarded his shed as adequate shelter and was completely content there. 
Secondly, he generally felt satisfied with his level of food intake. Thirdly, being the crime boss of the slums, he felt very safe, arguing that no one would ever touch him. He had no self-esteem issues either, since he had the respect of his fellow slum dwellers. It may have been fear, but he perceived it as respect. That is all that matters, and was quite content with who he was. I see. So it's not just about the reality of your situation, but also how you perceive that reality. Exactly. Most people would be very low on the hierarchy in his position, feeling like they wanted and needed much more. He did not. Now, what about case two, a multi-millionaire rock star? Well, you'd naturally assume he's fulfilled his physiological and safety needs, but when you read on through his profile, look here, he's plagued by paranoia and thinks someone is trying to kill him. On that basis, given his state of mind, he must believe that his safety is compromised. So safety must be his primary concern. Very good. And look here at case three, a property magnet. Having suffered badly during the recession, his portfolio of properties is in danger of being repossessed. In fact, look, he's in danger of losing everything and being left without even enough to support himself. Wow! So I guess he's gone from very high up right down to the bottom. Exactly. Even his basic needs are no longer secure. An excellent example of how there can be movement both ways on the pyramid. Case four: a housewife. She must have some esteem issues, surely. Read on. She is quite content and well respected and loved by her friends and family. What's more, being a housewife is all she ever wanted to do, and she has excelled at the task. Therefore, forget esteem. This lady has maximised her potential in her eyes. She's right at the top. And case five, a very sad case. It is what it is. There are always innocent victims of war, and he was left with nothing—not even a home over his head. Every day is a struggle to survive. How sad! And last but not least, case six: another rock star, though a different story. He says the only thing he craves is friendship. He has everything, but is awfully lonely. I think it's obvious where he is on Maslow's hierarchy. Indeed. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students, Jenna and Marco, discussing a business studies project they have to do. You now have fifteen seconds to read questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Come on, Marco. We've got to get on and sort out this project for Professor Buckley. Hang on. I want to make sure we've got all the information. Now, where are we? Well, today we need to sort out exactly what we're going to do and how we're going to divide the work up. Okay. How long have we got, by the way? Um, the end of term is April sixth. And he said to hand it in on week eight, so that's March twenty fifth at the latest, because the beginning of that week is the twenty first, so not long. Right. Have you got the notes there? Yes. He wants us to do a fairly small scale study, like the last one, on whether or not businesses were offering more benefits to staff. Mm. And we've now got to look at the rise in older workers. It should be fairly straightforward. Yeah, as long as we keep it small.、Mm. Who's marking it? I don't know. Sometimes he gets the PhD students to mark it for him. Oh, actually, it just says here a senior lecturer.、Mm. I suppose it's too much for Professor Barclay to do them all. Yeah. Anyway, how are we going to go about this? Well, 
We have to decide how big we want it to be and who... Yeah, we... but I think we must sort out a timetable for the project. Otherwise, nothing will get done. Okay. Uh, do you want to do that? All right. I'll do it as soon as we finish here. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. OK, what do we have to do now for the project? What's the best way to go about it? Um, well, Professor Carter suggested we set up a focus group to get some in-depth interviews, but I think that'll take a lot of time. Yeah, I agree. If we did a focus group, we'd have to spend time deciding who to include in it, and it's not necessary to do one anyway. Oh, fine. And if you agree, I think we should get in touch with the businesses on the list Professor Carter gave us and ask them if they're prepared to participate. Sounds good. Uh, then we can go there, give them questionnaires and collect them later. Exactly. OK. Then, do we need to book one of those study rooms in the library so we can work together to input the data? Perhaps not, as I guess just one of us could just sort it out, actually. Yes, that would be easier. A lot of what we're doing is qualitative, so it'll be writing up rather than statistics. No software for that, I'm afraid. <laughs> And I think it would look better if we had actual shots of some of the staff, because we're citing appearance as a factor in employability, aren't we? Yeah, OK. I'll factor that all in when I sort everything out tonight. I'm glad we decided to work together. I think it's going to work out well. Yes, well, given that we had to work in pairs on this project, I think we were right to choose each other. Hmm. We complement each other academically, as we're each good at what the other isn't. <laughs> In fact, we should have tried working together before. <laughs> yes. Now, how shall we split the work? I'll do the analysis, shall I? Oh, OK. It's just that it might be faster, because I'm used to doing it. Although your English is better than mine. I need more practice at reading, really. OK, I'll do the presentation then, if that's OK with you. Yeah, sure. I don't mind speaking in public, but I hate preparing all the notes for them. The thing is, the tutor said one person should do the whole presentation, and he said he expects me to do it because I haven't done one yet. No, that's fine. Now, let's see. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. This morning, I'd like to look at the whole issue of contemporary art. What it is, how do we interpret it, what are its uses, and does art, in effect, have any advantages or disadvantages for society? First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to this series of lectures on interpreting contemporary art. This morning, I'd like to look at the whole issue of contemporary art. What it is, how do we interpret it, what are its uses, and does art, in effect, have any advantages or disadvantages for society? I think at this point it's important for me to clarify that I am looking at art from two main perspectives. Firstly, art as something made by and appreciated by individuals, and secondly, art's relationship with society, as it is society that supports, protects and encourages art. And I'm hoping that this lecture will act as a springboard for you to revisit your own artistic experiences and question your own ideas of what contemporary art means. Throughout this series of lectures, I'll be looking at various examples of art to illustrate my points. However, if at any point I show you an example which is unfamiliar, then please tell me, as it is imperative that you be able to use your past experiences so that you can check to see if your ideas agree with mine. So if you have not seen a particular work of art before, then this will not work. And let me remind you now that at the end of these lectures, you will be given a written assignment which will consist of a 2,500-word critical essay. This is not an art review, but an analysis of what you think this kind of art means. OK. So, what is contemporary art? Well, my view is that contemporary art reflects a particular time in history. In terms of Western civilization, this is the period that became known as the Renaissance, which began roughly in 1450. But this becomes confusing as the modern era is also considered to be from 1789, from the time of the French Revolution. Added to this are modern ideas and modern art that developed from 1890. This period has also been called the turn of the century. To try and somehow bring all these periods together, I shall define contemporary art as any art created from 1920 up until the present day. Turning now to the question of whether or not art is useful for society. Uh, well, when we look back at the history of the West, we can see that there has been a tradition, especially in Western Europe, of art that was official. This meant that the government sponsored or subsidized the art. It could be said, therefore, that art has a cultural use in that it can represent both the culture and history of a country. And um, let's remember what I said earlier, that this is both the history and culture of a particular time. Now, the disadvantage of this kind of official art is that it tends to be academic. And by that, I mean it is art that requires the person looking at it to be educated in art, at least to some extent. So it seems to me that this restricts this type of art to a particular social group. And whether you agree with this concept or not will depend on if you believe that art should be accessible to everyone. Of course, with the rapid developments in technology and advertising the television, computer, and various forms of digital media, art has changed. And although there will always be a need for art to be subsidized by governments, we see today art forms that are surviving on individual subsidy. Sometimes this is through the support of wealthy patrons, such as businessmen or famous people. But it also operates on a more simple level. Uh, I refer here to the art that is done on walls and in streets, sometimes called amateur art. But it is the art of graffiti, and it is now accepted as an art form in itself. So here we come to what I see as another advantage for society, in that art is a means by which people can express their ideas, their feelings. Of course, in the case of graffiti, there is much debate as to whether the advantages outweigh the more negative side, which is when graffiti artists paint on public buildings. This creates unnecessary expense and also damages these buildings, which are meant for public use. We will be looking at some examples of this later on. Now, many critics of contemporary art 
have pointed to art that is often violent and、uh, even obscene. But I would like to suggest that such art is not meant to only shock us; it also has the element of exposure, so it can teach us about the violence in society. This then brings us to another advantage of art: it can raise awareness, help us see things in a different light. The disadvantage of this is that art can be dangerous. Um, what I'm saying here is that if we accept that contemporary art has the power to influence our feelings and attitudes, then we have to accept that art can evoke negative feelings like anger, as much as it can give us feelings of hope and peace. But art is, after all, about us, so it can be about our beliefs and our behaviour. And as human beings, we possess both positive. And negative traits. I'd like to show you some slides now to illustrate what I've been talking about. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.